Good afternoon. Uh, this morning, as you will have seen in a pre-recorded address, the Secretary General uh, spoke at the commemoration for the International Day of Reflection on the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. The Secretary General paid tribute to the victims and survivors of the genocide and re recalled how these days remain, how those days remain in our collective conscious as among the most horrific in recent human history. But he added that we must also take a hard look at today's world and ensure that we heed the lessons of 27 years ago. Around the globe, he said, people are threatened by extremist groups determined to boost their ranks through social polarization, political, and cultural manipulation. To prevent history from repeating itself, we need to counter these hate-driven movements that have become a transnational threat. Mr. The Secretary General added, saying we must forge a common agenda to renew and reinvigorate our collective actions going forward. And he also spoke to youth leaders today, as well as activists and youth-led organizations at a virtual ECOSOC Youth Forum. In his remarks, Mr. Guterres said he was immensely saddened by what the pandemic has done to the world's young people, disrupting their education, increasing youth employment, and worsening their mental health. The Secretary General said we should not be surprised that both online and in the streets, people, young people have been expressing their impatience with the pace of change, their alarm at the war on nature, their frustration with injustice and poor governance. He added that we, list, we must listen to them, rebuild their trust, and find ways to engage with them in the governance systems and democratic processes, strengthening work and for youth. He added that young people continue show, con, excuse me, he asked young people to continue showing the way on critical issues such as racial justice, gender equality, and the climate crisis. The Secretary General's Youth Envoy, uh, Jayathma Wikramanyake, uh, also spoke at the forum. And the UN mission in Libya will facilitate a three-day meeting of the Libyan Political Forum's Legal Committee in Tunis. That's from the 7th to the 9th of April. Uh, that is today, uh, the 7th. Uh, that meeting is intended to finalize discussions on constitutional basis, which will pave the way for national elections on December 24th of this year. In his opening remarks, the Special, en the special Envoy of the Secretary General, Jan Kubisch, welcomed the members of the Legal Committee and underscored the importance of efforts to achieve the objective of the roadmap adopted in Tunis last November. The UN's mission is, UN mission is fully committed to supporting the holding of national elections in accordance with the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum Roadmap and the overwhelming request of the Libyan people. The deliberations of the Legal Committee are a critical element to move the election preparations forward. Turning to Ethiopia, our colleagues tell us that the humanitarian situation in Tigray remains dire. While there has been substantial improvement in humanitarian access, active hostilities have been reported in northwestern, central, eastern, and southeastern and southern zones. Some humanitarian partners have accessed the towns of Gijet and Samre in the so southern and southeastern zones. They report that most of the population in these towns have fled. The Alamata Michele Adigrat Shire Road remains partially accessible. Our humanitarian colleagues say that an estimated 2.5 million people in rural Tigray have not had access to essential services over the last five months. The conflict continues to drive massive displacement across the regions, with tens of thousands of people moving forward, uh, uh, to, excuse me, moving towards urban areas, including to Michele and Shire. According to a recent assessment report, there could be as many as 450,000 people displaced in Shire. Our humanitarian partners are grappling with capacity and resource challenges as they scale up their response, which remains inadequate for the estimated 4.5 million people who need life-saving assistance. And turning to Mali, the UN mission there is telling us that peacekeepers have just conducted a long-range patrol covering over 1,200 kilometers from Goa to Tasinga in the center of Mali. This patrol is part of the mission's efforts to provide security and protect civilians in the region that is also known as the Three Borders Area. The day and night patrols were conducted over a period of 28 consecutive days. Throughout the mission, peacekeepers maintain constant contact with the Malian Armed Forces. They also engage with communities to discuss their concern and to better protect local population. 
local community members between Asongo and Tasiga reported back to the mission that cases of robbery and theft have not been recorded in the last in the two week period coinciding with the peacekeepers continued patrol of their region. Um, more is online and the mission has also produced a uh, very nice looking video uh, of the patrol. And uh, turning to the situation in, um, in the Red Sea, uh, I can tell you that we are concerned about another report of an incident in the Red Sea yesterday involving a vessel flying uh, the flag of the Re Islamic Republic of Iran. This is the fourth such incident in the region in just over a month. Although the circumstances around the incident remain unclear, we want to underscore the importance of the concerned par for the concerned parties, including countries in the region, to exercise maximum restraint and refrain from taking any escalatory actions, and in particular to respect their obligations under international law. And moving to Ukraine, uh, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that yesterday, shelling damaged a power line over the main lift pump. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Um, uh, we are told that yesterday, <coughs> sorry, sorry, we are told that yesterday uh, shelling damaged a power line near a main lift pumping station on South Donbas waterway in eastern part of Ukraine. This interrupted safe water supply for over a million people in 50 nearby settlements on both sides of the contact line. While repair teams are ab were able to fi quickly fix the damaged power lines today, we reiterate the call for all involved to avoid targeting critical water infrastructure in eastern Ukraine. This year, we, along with our humanitarian partners, require $168 million to help 1.9 million of the most vulnerable 3.4 million people in the east. Only 5.5% of this funding has been received. We also urge all concerned to provide unconditional access to those in need. And a COVAX update for you today from Costa Rica and the Dominican Republic. This morning, Costa Rica received more than 43,200 doses of a COVID-19 vaccine. This is the first shipment of nearly 220,000 doses expected to arrive soon. Our colleagues in Costa Rica hailed the arrival as a historic step towards the goal of ensuring access to an equitable distribution of vaccines globally. Meanwhile, the Dominican Republic received more than 91,000 doses last night. This is the first such batch of more than 2 million doses of vaccines expected to be received through COVAX. The UN team has been supporting authorities to address the pandemic, helping to deliver more than 60 tons of protective equipment to health personnel. Speaking of health personnel, today is World Health Day, and the theme this year is Together for a Fair, Healthier World. In his message, the Secretary General notes that the pandemic has revealed how unequal our societies are. He points out that thanks to the COVID COVAX initiative, more nations are now beginning to receive vaccine supplies, but most people in low- and middle-income countries still must watch and wait. The Secretary General stresses that such inequit inequ qualities, excuse me, are immoral and they are dangerous for our health, our economies, our societies. He says as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, we must implement policies and allocate resources so we can all enjoy the same health outcomes. Celia. I love to be the first one. James, the, the UN mission in South Sudan uh -huh. will reduce his staff by 7% this year. But as far as I know, the peace agreement has yet to be implemented. So does the UN think that this is the right thing to do in a country where peace is still very fragile? Look, uh, let me, I, I have to tell you, I, I've seen those reports. I have to get the details okay. of uh, of, of what's going on behind the, the mission. I think I would point you to what David Shearer said yesterday, that yes, uh, a, lot has been, uh, a lot has been achieved. Much remains to, to be done to consolidate the peace uh, and that it, uh, call on the political parties to work together for the benefit of those involved. Mr. Bayes. So first, um, on the statement you read out, um, which I want to assume is about the Iranian um, ship, the Savis, mm -hmm. Yep. Um, uh, Israel, uh, according to reports, has notified the U.S. 
that it carried out this attack. You said that everyone should respect their obligations under international law. If Israel did carry this out, was it a breach of international law? I mean, I haven't seen those uh, reports. Uh, we will look. We have seen what we have seen in the past um, uh, in the past month is a number of attacks on uh, ships that were diff with different flags, uh, different owners. Uh, what we do not want to see is any escalation, tit for tat. Uh, the freedom of navigation is critical uh, all over the world, but especially in this region, uh, in the Red Sea uh, and in the Persian Gulf. So would an attack like the one that we saw there, whoever carried it out, would it be illegal under international well, law? Look, I think everyone understands what their uh, responsibilities are, and we want them to be respected. I just want you to tell us what I, 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 are. You know, I, <laughs> I have to see the uh, the details of... of, of I, I, I can't go any further in this. Uh, one point, other th quick question, if I, if I may. Um, there are reports from Washington that the U.S. is about to make an announcement of funding to the Palestinians, money to UNRWA and other monies. Do you, can the UN confirm that it's been notified by the US about this? Yes, we've seen those reports. It is also our understanding that uh, a major announcement uh, is imminent. Uh, obviously, we welcome uh, this announcement if it turns out to be true. And we have no, uh, we have no uh, indication that it's not. We're waiting for the official announcement. But we, we very much uh, welcome it. The, the relationship uh, between the United States and UNRWA is a long-standing relationship. Um, we hope that um, others will now follow suit. Uh, there were a number of, of countries that had greatly reduced or halted uh, contributions to UNRWA. Uh, we hope that uh, the, American, uh, the American decision will lead others to rejoin uh, UNRWA as, uh, as UNRWA donors. Uh, Edie and then Stefano. Sorry, Steph. Uh, thank you. I have uh, two questions. Uh, first, um, the AP has done a major story on the apparent uh, cleansing of Tigrayans. And I wonder if the Secretary General has any comment on what's happening there and what the UN is trying to do to actually document this and prevent it. Yes, we, we've read the, the story, which is a harrowing, uh, a harrowing story. Um, we are very concerned about uh, these latest reports of human rights violations, and we've seen others since the beginning of this uh, conflict. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the, um, our colleagues at the UN Human Rights Office are in discussions uh, with uh, Ethiopian counterparts to do joint uh, investigations with the Ethiopian Human Rights uh, Commission. We hope that these uh, investigations will, um, uh, uh, will be carried out thoroughly. Um, Part of the prevention is also about access uh, and greater access for humanitarians and for uh, for aid personnel, and we continue on that uh, on that front. And a, a second question on uh, Yemen and uh, where Mr. Griffiths is, what he's doing, and is. Um, any UN effort being made to try and de-escalate the situation in Marib? Uh, Mr. Griffiths, as I recall, uh, is in Amman. As you know, he had done quite extensive traveling in the last uh, in the last week. He'd been, uh, well, before that, he was in uh, Oman and uh, traveled to Riyadh as well. He's continuing his contacts to for to excuse me. He's continuing his contacts from Amman and we're continuing our efforts to try to find a way to halt uh, the fighting in, uh, in Marine. Stefano Vaccara, and then we'll go to the screen. <coughs> Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, this is an update on uh, Mario Paciola case with a question. Um, recently, uh, an Italian publication, um, 
with an article by Gabriele Santoro, an interview a prosecutor, Colombian prosecutor Giovanni Alvarez Santoyo. He is not just a prosecutor, he works on, uh, um, on the organization that, that for the peace process. He investigates um, crimes that being during the, yeah. that's been done. So he's involved in the peace process. Well, he uh, asked about what he thinks about the Mario Paciola case. He say, and I quote, this death is an attack on the, pro on the peace process and uh, then this country is trying to do, and on the quality of the support that, to, that the, mission, the United Nations mission can do on this process. So my question is, uh, in, this, in this moment, you know, it's not anymore a question to try to find out the truth about the death of somebody that was working for the United Nations in Colombia. But does that Secretary General think that to find out what really happened to Mario Paciola means also to help the peace process in Colombia? Look, we want to find out uh, what happened to uh, our colleague first and foremost for the sake of his family and those around him who have uh, suffered a tremendous uh, loss. It is not for me to prejudge uh, the uh, conclusions of the Colombian and the Italian criminal investigations. We continue uh, to support them and we continue to support uh, the people of Colombia uh, with our large presence there. Okay, uh, Abdel Hamid. And then Ibtissam, and then Toby, I think. Thank you, Stefan. I have two questions. One on the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, the uh, folks in Congo completely collapsed. Sudan now is asking to be to participate in the management of the uh, dam, so they will not uh, it will not hurt their water supplies. While Egypt said they want to go back to the Security Council and the General Assembly. My question, why the Secretary General does not take a proactive role and be, become involved personally in a brewing crisis that has been developing for the last few months and becoming a kind of a threat to international peace and security? That's my first question. Okay. What has been cleared for us, clear for the Secretary General, is that this issue can only be resolved through peaceful means, and his call is for urgent and concrete measures to the parties to de-escalate tensions, build confidence, and de demonstrate compromise in good faith. Uh, we've obviously seen the statements that came out of the, uh, the talks in Kinshasa. Uh, the Secretary General is following this, I can tell you, very, very closely, uh, has in the past talked to various uh, parties. Um, our stance on, on being available to help uh, help the parties and also support the AU mediation uh, continues. But I can assure you that this is something, uh, I know we always say he's following this closely, but I do know for a fact that he is following this extremely closely. Your second question, my sir. Second, my second question this morning, in, in, at the entrance of a Palestinian village near Hebron called Samoa, S A M O U. A Palestinian old woman of 73 years old, her name is Shafiqa Muhammad Suleiman Abu Aqil, was run and killed by a settler. That is happening this morning. Is there, are you aware of this incident? I, and I, what do you and can I, do as the Israeli? I, Attention to the right, and their crimes against the Palestinians are escalating I, by the day. I, I had not personally heard of this case. Obviously, this is something that needs to be uh, investigated uh, fully, but we will check with our, our colleagues. If to some. Uh, thanks, Steph. I have a, a follow-up on the issue. Uh, first, thanks for, uh, I got the, an answer from my question about the landmine yesterday, but I have a follow-up on the subject regarding Rick's question uh, uh, and that whether you had any comments on um, uh, the Pentagon uh, announcement or press secretary announcement uh, that they are uh, analyzing the issue and uh, 
still not taking back actually the um, uh, the um, the policy that was uh, uh, that took place by the um, uh, Trump administration last year. Look, our uh, our stand is remains clear, uh, and that from our standpoint, from the Secretary General's standpoint, uh, we want to see every country uh, sign up to the anti-personnel landmine uh, convention, and we support every effort, uh, and we call on every country to do whatever they can to eliminate this weapon, which strikes indiscriminately. Uh, and it is so insidious uh, that uh, is able to kill and continue killing and maiming um, years after it was laid into the ground. Uh, Toby, I have, so. Uh, another question. Yes, please, please. Um, so my question is on uh, the, um, the Rwanda uh, um, genocide and whether after all these years uh, you can maybe point out to uh, which lessons did the UN uh, learn uh, from uh, what happened back then and its own role. Thank you. Look, the UN's own role, I think, was uh, analyzed and dissected in a, in a seminal report uh, that came out a few years uh, after the genocide, which had been com commissioned by former Secretary General Kofi Annan. I think one of the, one of the lessons uh, learned is to ensure that we tell the Security Council what they need to know, not what they want to know, not to self-censor, um, to ensure that uh, we, we focus on the protection of civilians. And I think that's something you have see, we have seen in peacekeeping missions uh, throughout since the, um, uh, since the, uh, the genocide. One example I would point to is um, in, in South Sudan when, um, God, we're all dating ourselves here, but tw and, uh, when there was a mass, when they, this was 2014, 2013, um, when civilians uh, were being hunted down, uh, when civil strife renewed. If you'll recall, the UN opened the doors to its peacekeeping bases in South Sudan. Which, all, which became point, uh, protection of civilian sites. Uh, and the Secretary General at the time, Ban Ki-moon, was very clear in giving instructions uh, to his commanders on the ground. It's just, just do it. Focus on saving people. So I think that the focus of our work on the protection of civilians is one of the most important lessons uh, learned from that time. Uh, Toby. Thanks, Steph. Uh, three questions for you today. First is, it looks like tomorrow that uh, world finance chiefs are going to extend the TSSI. Uh, it's going to be $650 billion more in special drawing rights, and also this language on trade protectionism is going to be uh, dropped. Um, what is the uh, SG's reaction to these, uh, these developments? Well, l let's uh, let's see what actually comes out. The the issue of special drawing rights and expanding them is something the Secretary General had uh, called for. All the things you mentioned are things he had called for. I think we will wait to see what the scope of the decisions uh, reached are before we uh, we comment. Thanks. Okay, and then can you just. Uh, this is a bit of a remedial question here, but why why did 91,000 doses go to the Dominican Republic from COVAX and 43,000 go to Costa Rica? What how, how do these numbers get determined by location? It's a very good question, uh, and I, I I will assume, but I will also check um, that part of it is. Uh, what the countries actually request, because as you know, some of these countries are also getting vaccines through other means. Uh, it is also how, uh, what is the absorption capacity of, of the country at the time uh, to get uh, vaccines. So these are things that are, that are worked, worked out, but I can try to give you a bit more, a bit more details. Thanks. And then just finally, um, did you send the, have we gotten the youth uh, remark, the SG's remarks to the youth event from today? Uh, 
I, I don't think we were we were shown no. those. If if you were not shown, we will show them to you. And I apologize. Um, and you're young enough to get them too. Um, uh, and on Kovax, I would also encourage you to reach out directly to to Kovax, um, Mr. Bulcati. Alan. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I have a question on Ukraine. The situation on uh, Eastern Ukraine is quite tense right now. Do you have any assessment of the situation over there? Do you have any appeal to the sides? Thank you. <clears throat> Well, our, our appeal is obviously uh, for all involved to do whatever they can to lower, uh, lower the tensions. Celia uh, and then Mr. Bayes, to go back to the original order. Uh, Stefan, do we have an update on the killing of uh, the Italian ambassador in uh, DRC? No, uh, it's a good question because I was thinking about that just yesterday. I needed to ask, so I will ask, get something to you. I'm also requesting updates. Um, we keep um, hearing that a, uh, a meeting on Afghanistan in Turkey is imminent. Do we have any information on that meeting and what the delay is? Uh, no, what I can, um, uh, I mean, I shouldn't say no and then answer. <laughs> no is my initial reaction to any question you ask, James. Uh, then I get a hold of myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are a series of consultations going on in Doha and in Dushanbe uh, with representatives of Qatar, the U.S., uh, regional states, Afghan parties, uh, concerning the proposed uh, conference that we hope will be held in Istanbul uh, later this month. Uh, there will also be discussions in um, in, in Kabul, uh, and we obviously remain uh, committed to find, helping find a peaceful resolution to the conflict in Afghanistan. But you said this month. You're confident it will be now this month. Uh, you know, um, that's what our aim is. Uh, let me put it that way. OK, and one more update. Um, again, something that's been flagged repeatedly, which is um, the Myanmar special envoy, Christine mm -hmm. Schrana Bergener. Um, I know she's still trying to get mm -hmm. into the country mm -hmm. itself, but we were told she was about to embark on a regional visit. C can you tell us Yes, so that? I think she's waiting for all the necessary green lights. Uh, she hopes uh, to go there in the, next, uh, in the next few days. As soon as something's confirmed, we will confirm it. Okay, uh, I'm delighted to leave the podium to Amy. Um, and see you manana. <laughs>